Christmas Eve. So uh, uh, he's finally had a sore throat, but he says he's just been very, very busy. And uh, he's uh, Larry Ballback uh, is over here now, or in New York, and will be for two, three months. So uh, Larry, uh, D David's having to do extra work and keep some of his assignments also. So he said not for us not to expect for him to write quite so frequently. He did have one paragraph in his letter about, he said uh, there was a big communist rally in Lisbon and that there were between 200 and 300,000 people in the rally and uh, there were no, uh, uh, there were no streetcars running or anything like that while they were having their rally. And he says he got some, climb, got up in a window in a building and got some good pictures of it. So uh, he uh, says that uh, the uh, communist in Portugal are becoming bolder and bolder all the time. And uh, that has uh, some advantages and disadvantages. He says many of the people feel extremely insecure and uh, they're looking for security somewhere and that it makes them receptive to the gospel. It says uh, the missionaries that are working over there say they've never seen a time when the Portuguese people were more open for hearing uh, the message uh, from the Lord's work. And uh, they just want everybody to keep praying that uh, the Lord will keep the doors open. They have perfect freedom now. They're not molested in any way. And uh, they uh, carry on their ministry just as they want to, and the, and the uh, people have no persecution from the government or from the Catholic Church over there. The Catholic Church has, in Portugal has lost most of its hold on the people, and uh, they're just, uh, they just don't have an anchor, so to speak. And uh, so uh, it is a very fruitful time uh, in the ministry. I, I brought his letter to read portions to um, the other Bible studies, but I did. Did I read it Wednesday night at Frostproof? No, I, don't I didn't. Read one from, uh, oh, uh, George I see. I must be just uh, the only place I read it is the Lakeland Bible study. I just uh, haven't got all my cobwebs cleared out, I suppose. But it was a very interesting letter. He wrote it was about three pages, and it gave us quite a lot of insight on the ministry, what they're able to do. Told about some people that had come to Christ and uh, some of their crusades they're having, and then about this big communist rally, and he did make some comments on the fact that uh, they don't have a government in Portugal now other than just sort of a caretaker. They're not able to, to do much, uh, and uh, a caretaker-type government uh, tends to lose control uh, if uh, they don't uh, get a good, firm government established. So. Everything over there is very, very politically insecure, and uh, they, uh, uh, but they're, uh, they're having just unusual response uh, to the word, and they're thankful for that. So the Lord uh, knows how to get His work done, and uh, but it's a rather amazing thing. These young fellows over there in their young twenty, I mean early twenties, and the Lord's given them <coughs> tremendous responsibilities. Uh, so uh, I'm sure that uh, our prayers would be well placed, directed in that, that way. Um, when I was here last, I didn't read a, a letter from George Tice and one from Joe Jordan. My, I'm getting negligent. I didn't have the letter here where Joe had written back uh, uh, as a result of... You said you left it. You forgot oh, it. Oh, he I said see. he'd give the names of the people. Yes. Else, but you said you forgot it. You I see. It. Well, I'll have to do better, won't I? <laughs> uh, Hosea, chapter 7. As we pointed out last time, the uh, section that we're in here really starts in verse 4 of chapter 6. O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? And then uh, the reason for this is coming up. He says, I have promised the 
sure mercies of David in verse 7, but they like men have transgressed the covenant. And then he tells about how first Gilead went astray. They were the first part uh, to go into idolatry. And that uh, then in verse 10, I have seen a horrible thing in the house of Israel. Uh, there is whoredom of Ephraim. Israel is defiled. And then he says that Judah is also being infected. And remember, it's the uh, province uh, of uh, the prophet Hosea to bring the message to this nation as to why God must bring judgment upon them. Uh, Hosea has clearly been told that uh, the nation will not repent at his preaching, and his preaching is not unto repentance. God says the, the people have their minds so set and their ways so framed that uh, uh, they'll not respond. They, they don't have a capacity to respond. You know, uh, the message of God can go out in power, but if there's no response from the hearer, and this is why Jesus said repeatedly when he was speaking, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear, because there's a time when your ears won't hear. And he says the reason, remember back in chapter 5, verse 4, they will not frame their doings to turn unto their God. And uh, so he said that they wouldn't hear. And uh, so the preaching is not unto repentance. It's by way of explanation. God is explaining by his prophet why he's acting as he is. You remember we went back last week and uh, found that there were responsibilities under this covenant. There was an if you will, and there was also an if you won't. And they had uh, uh, acted in accordance with the if you won't. And so God is having to fulfill his promises, as we read there in the 26th chapter of uh, Leviticus. And then the, the uh, similar, similar passage in Deuteronomy that had to do with the subsequent generation. So let's move on to chapter 7. Verse 1, when, when I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered or uncovered, and the wickedness of Samaria, for they commit falsehood, and the thief, thief cometh in, and the troop of robbers spoileth without, and they consider not in their hearts that I remember all of their wickedness. Now, their own doings have beset them about. They are before my face, that is, their doings. They make the king glad with their wickedness and the princess with their lies. Now, in, in verse 1, this country is called Israel, it's called Ephraim, and it's called Samaria. These are the three names by which Hosea describes the ten northern tribes. You remember in Hosea's time for uh, several generations, the country had been divided into two parts. There was the southern kingdom, comprised of uh, mostly of the tribe of Judah, with some influx from Benjamin. And then there, uh, they, the capital there was at Jerusalem. The kings reigned at Jerusalem, and they carried on their worship at the temple at Jerusalem. And then the northern ten tribes had the capital in Samaria, which was a city in the uh, country of, I mean, in the uh, section of the country that was inhabited by the tribe of Ephraim. Ephraim was the principal tribe of the northern kingdom. And the capital was in their section, and uh, the, cap the name of the capital was Samaria. So when they speak of Ephraim, they're talking of all of the northern tribes, and Ephraim being uh, where the king ruled and where the worship was, and uh, where the capital city was, of course. Sometimes the country is called by the name Samaria because it's common Bible uh, language to call a country by its capital city. But there's a slightly different connotation as to whether or not Israel is used or Ephraim is used or Samaria is used. When Israel is used, it calls attention to the fact that they are God's people because the name Israel means 
prince of God or principal ones of God. And uh, when Ephraim is being used, it's speaking primarily of the, of the government of the northern group and what the government, the kings, have got them to do. And when Samaria is speaking of, it's speaking of the fact that they had become a mixture of Israelites and others. So there's a slightly different connotation depending upon which of these names uh, the prophet calls the people of the area. And he's calling them here by all three names. And uh, he's saying that uh, they've committed falsehood and that if thieves come in and robbers come in, they can spoil. Now what he's really referring to is the fact that the surrounding countries are going to be able to come in and take them captive because God will not protect them. Remember, uh, we went back and read in the uh, fifth chapter of Isaiah where they were promised uh, uh, a privileged place and the protection of God. They were promised position. They were promised protection. And uh, uh, they were uh, promised privilege. Uh, we might just review that a moment because it'll, it'll help us to, to see what we have here. In Isaiah chapter 5. We'll need this portion again uh, when uh, we get to the 10th chapter. But we'll just, this will give you an idea of what, what we have. In Isaiah 5, verse 1, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. Now, the pre-incarnate Christ is the beloved, and the vineyard is Israel. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he digged it and gathered out the stones and planted it with the choicest vine, and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a wine press in it. And he looked for it to bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. Now, in verse 1, it says that this vineyard is in a very fruitful hill. That is, they had position. In verse 2, it says uh, that he planted it with the choicest vine. They had provision. And then it says in verse 2 that he built a tower in the midst of it. So it had protection. It had position, provision, and protection. Verse 3. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard? Uh, they had privilege. Position, provision, protection, and privilege. What uh, could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done to in it? Wherefore, when I look for it to bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes, and now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be eaten up, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. Now, you, you get the picture. Suppose a vine keeper, a uh, 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 man that owned a vineyard, let's suppose he did everything possible that he could do to make a vineyard productive. He put it in the very best ground. He planted it with the very best stock. He uh, cared for it by fertilizing and watering it in the very best manner. He protected it from the animals around by putting a wall and from robbers and so forth by putting up a tower and to where nothing could possibly be done uh, more for it. And then this vineyard only produces wild grapes that were of no commercial value whatsoever. Now, would such a one, in prudence, would he continue to put effort into that vineyard year after year after year? No. And that's the answer here. Israel had position, provision, protection, and privilege. But they didn't fulfill their part of the obligation. So look at verse 6. I will lay it waste. I shall, it shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. So there's no doubt in our minds who he's talking about, is there? He says the vineyard is the house of Israel. So since they uh, would not respond to position, to provision, to protection, and to privilege, then there must come punishment. 
And this is Hosea's job to explain why the walls are going to be torn down and the, and the robbers come. Because God is going to take away their favored position. He's going to take away their privilege. He's going to take away their protection. And uh, uh, he, he's going to let them be punished. He's not going to punish them, but they're going to be punished in that he will not protect them. He'll take away his protection. And the robbers will come in. See, back in Hosea chapter 7. The thief cometh in, and a troop of rider, ro uh, robbers spoil without. So, because they will not frame their doings to hear God's word, then these other nations are going to come in and despoil the vineyard because God will take his protecting hand away. And this is what Hosea is speaking of. Verse 2, And they consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. He says, These people are acting like that God doesn't know what's going on. And now their own doings have beset them about. They are before my face. I don't get, usually get to listen to the morning news on the TV because uh, it doesn't fit in with uh, getting my Bible study done in the morning and then getting breakfast and going to work. But this morning, I suppose, was a little different morning in some ways because I didn't go to work or not where I usually work anyway. And uh, so I watched the news, and they had this lady on there who was very indignant. She uh, admittedly is living, has been living with a man out of wedlock for the past seven years. And uh, so uh, the Justice Department doesn't think that's a proper background uh, for their employees. And uh, so she's got a lawsuit about it. She's about to lose her job because she won't live uh, as the Justice Department says she ought to live. And her comment was that uh, she's being accused of being immoral. And she says, uh, she says, as far as I'm concerned, I'm being perfectly moral. Now, some of you might have seen her on the TV this morning. Uh, some of you did. But in her own eyes, you see, she was, what she was really saying is, God is not paying any attention in whatever he has to say about it. Now, people like that, they know that the Bible teaches against that. They know that. They're not that ignorant of what the Bible says. And she knows that the Bible teaches against that. But what she's really saying is that I can do what I want to and I can call moral whatever I want to call moral. And God doesn't have anything to say about it. Well, so you see, we're living in a day just like uh, uh, what I'm saying didn't happen in Europe or it didn't happen uh, several years ago. That happened this morning on this morning's news that I'm talking about. And she was so indignant that, uh, that her employer, who happens to be the federal government, the Department of Federal Government, should have anything to say about her private life. And, of course, uh, if that's it, I mean, that's one story, but, for, but she gave, she said, she says the thing that bothers her so bad is that she is being called immoral, and she is not immoral. Uh, she said, uh, the way I look at it, I'm not being immoral. So uh, uh, you had the same situation here, that they're saying God doesn't remember, or God doesn't know of their wickedness. And then in verse 3, they make the king glad with their wickedness and the princess with their lies. Now what this is saying is, that people are trying to figure out how to get the kings or the governmental authorities to let them engage in any kind of sin they want to. You see, it's the responsibility of government to guard the social laws and to make sure that the constituency of the government has the proper environment in which to raise children and so forth. That's part of a laws, a government's responsibility. And their problem was, back in Hosea's day was, that the people tried to figure out how to make the government happy and do as they wanted to as far as their own per, uh, personal lives. They were saying the same thing this lady was saying. Now, the government's paying her salary. In fact, as you and I are paying her salary. Uh, but uh, she says we don't have any rights of any kind 
to uh, judge what's moral for her and what isn't moral for her. And so that's what this third ver verse means. They make the king glad with their wickedness and the princess with their lies. Uh, what should be against the law and what should make the king angry with them and cause him to force his law, they found out how to make him pleased with their doing so they can be as wicked as they want to without incurring the wrath of the government. That's what this verse is saying. Verse 4, they are all adulterers. You know, you, could, you couldn't hardly... See, they, they say, well, this is all right because I'm going to make it my business to see that my government says it's all right. We've already, our government already has said that it's all right for homosexuals to have their uh, jobs protected, even to teaching our children. They, uh, they speak of a type of life where there wouldn't be any children. If everybody was a homosexual, how many children would there be? Any? No. Homosexuality can't uh, produce children, can it? Uh, and yet, uh, we as a government now officially say that it's, it's all right for them to teach our children. They have a right to do that. And uh, this, is, this is the very subject matter that we're on here. And God says they're all adulterers. That's what God thinks of such a person that thinks their actions is moral. Like an oven heated by the baker who ceases from rising, raising after he kneaded it, uh, kneaded the dough until it be leavened. In the day of our king, the princes have made him sick with skins of wine. He stretches out his hand with scoffers or with scorners, for they have made ready their heart like an oven while they lie in wait. Their baker sleeps all the night. In the morning, it burns like a flaming fire they are all hot as an oven and have devoured their judges all their kings are fallen there is none among them that calleth upon me now what does all that mean well first let's get the picture here's how a baker operated he wanted to bake bread the next day so what he would do he would uh, mix his dough it's called kneading here and he'd put his leaven in it and then he would heat the oven just enough so that it would make the leaven work well. He didn't have quite as fancy yeast as we have today, you know, and uh, we might not need that much heat. But the, the uh, uh, leavening that they used required heat to operate. So he'd put it in the oven on a very low heat. And then he could go to sleep. He wasn't going to heat up the oven until, uh, enough to break the, uh, bake the bread. Now, what is leaven? Well, in the Bible, it speaks of how evil permeates. What leaven is, in bread dough, for instance, it causes the dough to ferment. That's why it rises. And if, if the uh, dough with leaven in it was not baked pretty quick, it would rot. If uh, any, any of these ladies could tell you. If they, if they didn't bake their bread at the right time or put it in the refrigerator to stop the leaven from acting. Well, when they didn't have refrigerators back then, at a certain time, it's got to be put in the oven or the, or the loaf will become just a rotten stench, the whole loaf, because it, it, would, uh, it, would, well, it would rot. And the only way to kill the leaven is to make the furnace hot and bake it. And, of course, the reason they use the leaven is so that uh, they get a, a lighter type bread. But when leaven is used in the Bible, it stands for how evil permeates. We'll see this as we go along. <clears throat> but the picture that we have here is that somebody has put a little evil into their lives and it's grown all night and now it's permeated the whole loaf and nothing's going to stop it but judgment. And the and the oven being heated with fire, uh, it speaks of the judgment. See, the, the nation of Israel is going through, uh, going to go be placed in a furnace of fire. If they're not, 
Well, the leaven, the leaven is going to putrefy the whole loaf. So this is where the imagery comes from. Uh, back in verse 4 again, like an oven heated by the baker. In other words, he's just heated a little bit so that the leaven will work. And he ceases from raising after he's kneaded it, the dough until it be leavened. In other words, when he gets the, the dough all mixed up and the leaven in there, he doesn't bake it immediately. He waits for the leaven to operate. So he puts it in the warm oven and goes to bed. By the time he wakes up, it'll be all right. He needs to do something then, or his bread will all ruin. And God's answering his question uh, back in uh, uh, chapter 6, verse 4, O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? And Judah, what shall I do unto thee? The only thing that will cure the situation is for them, him to bake them in an oven, is what he's saying. And he says the reason is, is because they don't have a proper government. See, the, the kings and the princes have been fed so much wine that the people scoff at their supposed authority. And, of course, that's what we do. We, uh, we elect people to rule us, and we send them to Washington, and we fill them so full of liquor that they couldn't make a, a wise decision if they had to. And we pay for the liquor, by the way, and get them drunk. And they stay half drunk. Most of them do. Most of the time, they're up there. It's big one big round of, of liquor parties on us. That's the way we operate our government. We think that's fine. You say, well, I think it's fine. Well, as a group of governed people, we countenance that. If we didn't countenance, it wouldn't happen, would it? No. Why do we want our, why is it all right for us, for our government to, uh, officials to be like that? Because unconsciously, we realize that that gives us license to do what we want to do. In other words, if the government is supposed to keep us straight, how can they keep us straight if they're not straight? So if we get them crooked, then we can be crooked and feel all right about it. This is, this is what Jeremiah said, that means when he says, the heart of man is desperately wicked. Wicked, who can know it? We don't like to admit that. Face to it. And uh, so... Uh, just take a guy like uh, this fellow, what was alcoholic, and he, um, he, he, and he was in a very influential position. Was it the Armed Forces? What? Ways and means. Yeah, Ways and Means. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and yet he said he was an alcoholic. Well, but he didn't, he didn't think, he excused himself because he was a victim. And uh, yet, how could he be a, how could he, while he was uh, involved in alcoholism and involved in all kind of uh, sexual promiscuity and all of that and paying with government funds for his own personal uh, satisfactions, how could he, uh, in good conscience, require morality of his subjects? He couldn't. So you see how it works when government is corrupt? And then, uh, all types of criminal elements scoff at government. That's what this fifth verse means. In the day of our prince, uh, king, the princes have made him sick with skins of wine. He stretches, stretched out his hands with the scoffers. And in other words, what he's stretching out his hand, he means he carries on his government responsibilities. In cohort with his scoffers, the people that say, <laughs> we got this guy where we want him. We paid him off, you know, and he'll do anything we want to do. And so his actions are done in that type of an environment. That's what it's, what it's talking about here. Verse six. That 6, For they have made ready their heart like an oven, while they lie in wait. Their baker sleeps all the night. In the morning it burns like a flaming fire. What God is saying is, well, look, all of this has been going on in the night. Now the leaven has done its work, and the baker's about to wake up, and the oven's going to be heated with fire because judgment's going to come to kill the leaven. 
uh, and uh, he says, it's the time for judgment has come. They're all hot as an oven, have devoured their judges. All their kings are fallen. That means they had a king, but he wasn't any good. There is none among them that calleth on me. Well, now, we have, a, we have a very similar situation, you know, in our own, our own environment, in our own time. And as surely as God brought judgment there, he's going to bring judgment. The baker will wake up, and the baker will know that the fires of judgment are going to have to be lit, or the bread will putrefy. It's ripe, it's ready. The leaven has done its work all night. Now let's make sure that we understand what leaven is. Uh, if you want personal insight, I recommend for your reading the 12th and 13th chapters of Exodus. And this will tell how the Feast of Unleavened Bread was instituted. And uh, they were advised that they could not eat bread with any leaven in it. It said that they must knead their dough without leaven and carry it with them. And uh, the explanation of what that means, of course, is in the New Testament. And we look up two or three New Testament verses. First in Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew 16, 6. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread, which, uh, which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves, because ye have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves and the five thousand, how many baskets you took up? Neither the seven loaves and the four thousand, how many baskets you took up? How is it that you do not understand? That when I spoke, not, that I spoke not to you concerning bread, but that you should beware of the leaven, of the Pharisees, and of the Sadducees. Then understood they that he bade them not to beware of the leaven of bread, literally, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Now, there's a parallel verse to this in Mark chapter eight, verse fifteen. And it also there speaks of the, of the leaven of the Herodians. But we want to look now in Luke chapter 12, verse 1. In the meantime, when they were gathered together, an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now, in the Matthew scripture, it said that leaven speaks of false doctrine, false teaching. And then it identifies that that particular leaven, which he calls the leaven of the Pharisees, is hypocrisy. It's a show of piety without having it in your heart. That's what hypocrisy is. It's an outward form of religion. Paul calls it having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And by reading carefully, you can deduce that the Pharisees, uh, that the uh, leaven of the Sadducees is uh, uh, religion without the supernatural. Uh, they didn't believe in the resurrection, for instance. Somebody says, of course, that's where they got their name. The, the uh, looking forward to the bodily resurrection is called a joyful hope. And they didn't believe in it, so they were sad, you see. Uh, the uh, uh, doctrine of the, uh, the leaven of the Herodians was uh, conformity, world conformity. In other words, you fit in, you fit your religion into the world system so that you can, uh, you know, attract the world. But those are teachings or doctrines, and it's called leaven. Uh, so, when Jesus used the term leaven fi uh, uh, figuratively, it had an evil connotation, did it not? 
All right, let's see. How about when Paul uses the term? First in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He's speaking of a man that's in the assembly of Christians who was living in open immorality. The same general situation as this lady I said was on the TV. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. Deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. In other words, they were glorying that they had Christian liberty and uh, although it might not be the social thing, uh, if this is what that person wanted to do. It was his own private life, so let him do it. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So leaven stands for false doctrine, for malice, for wickedness, uh, immorality, and leaven stands for sincerity and truth. That shouldn't be too difficult, should it? And it's so used other places in, uh, uh, in the New Testament. For instance, uh, I'll just give you... In Galatians 5, 9 would be another pertinent scripture. We won't look that up, but you might want to look it up on your own. So, uh, the situation in the Corinthian church was this. They had immorality in their church group. Uh, church group. And Paul says, you're going to have to get rid of the immorality, or it's going to be like leaven. And pretty soon the whole lump will be leavened. That is, everybody will be infected with it. And that is what happened, had happened to Israel. The whole country was infected because the leaven had done its work and permeated the whole lump. And there's nothing now but to heat the oven hot and devour the judges, those who are supposed to make right right, and the kings are to, uh, will be fallen. Verse 8, Ephraim hath mixed himself among the people Ephraim is a cake not turned. Now, what it's saying is that God had told his people to be separate, not to take on the ways of the surrounding heathen nations. And uh, the picture is, is Ephraim is the loaf of bread, and they've let the practices, the false doctrines of the surrounding nations be kneaded in to their dough, so to speak. And now, that has permeated the whole lump. And uh, uh, they're just like a cake that needs to be turned, needs to be cooked. They're not turned yet. They just, the, the leaven has worked, and nothing will cure it. Nothing in the world will stop the leaven from working, except to put the loaf in the oven and bake it. That kills the, the leaven. It won't work anymore. And uh, so that's what it's going to be. I suppose that's what it means by Ephraim is a cake not turned. I suppose some other connotations would be proper. Uh, certainly if you had a, a cake that's cooked on the top of the stove uh, and uh, all the cooking was on the bottom and none on the top, uh, it wouldn't be fit for anything, would it? It'd be burnt on the bottom, and just a mess on top, wouldn't it? I, it may have some connotation there, but if it fits into the rest of it here, it simply means that uh, Ephraim has uh, worked, the leaven's worked until there's nothing will help now. But, but the fires of judgment. Verse 9, Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth it not. Uh, he says he's just like a, a man 
who, if he'd look in the mirror, he'd see he's getting gray-headed. But uh, he still thinks he's young as ever. He doesn't see. He, he's blinded himself to the fact that uh, gray hairs mean something. Uh, all my kids were home for, for Christmas, and, you know, uh, they I've, I've heard them say, well, uh, my daddy they still doesn't have any gray hairs. Well, they just didn't look close enough. Uh, I have some gray hairs. They're not, they're not enough of them yet so that you might see them from your vantage point. Uh, I can tell that Brother Shade has three or four. Uh, but uh, uh, you can't tell, maybe, that I've got gray hairs. But I do have. And uh, uh, they say, you're, you're like somebody that ignores that. You think you're, you're still in your youth. And something's happening that you're not detecting. Verse 11. Ephraim also is like a silly dove without a heart. They call to Egypt. They go to Assyria. Now, the figurative language in Hosea is more concentrated than anywhere else in the Bible. Uh, for instance, I've marked some of the things that Israel have been called here up to this time. Israel has been called an adulterous wife, a backsliding heifer, uh, a, uh, a heated oven, a cake not turned, a silly dove. Uh, they've been called troops of robbers. Uh, all kind of picturesque speech, and, and it's just getting started. We're going to have all kind of picturesque speech, uh, speech still to come. But Ephraim is also is like a silly dove. Without heart, they call to Egypt. They go to Assyria. When they shall go, I will spread my net upon them. I will bring them down like the fowls of the heaven. I will chastise them as their congregation hath heard. Woe unto them, for they have fled from me. Destruction unto them, because they have transgressed against me, though I have redeemed them, yet they have spoken lies against me. Now, what does all this mean? Ephraim, Ephraim is like a silly dove without a heart that calls to uh, Egypt and that uh, goes down to Assyria. Well, what he's saying is that uh, they're just flitting around. They don't really know where they're going. They haven't thought it through. And uh, they know they've got some problems. And instead of turning to God, what they're going to turn to, to Assyria, and this is what Israel did, they, they called upon Assyria to help them against another enemy. And when Assyria, when Assyria saw how helpless they were, they said, well, we'll take them. You know. And the very people they called on to help them overran them. And then they went trotting down to Egypt. And Egypt didn't love them. And, uh, of course, Jeremiah, uh, who prophesied sometime after Hosea, he put it another way in Jeremiah chapter 2. In Jeremiah 2, verse 13, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water says they've got a source of beautiful crystal clear water uh, of life to drink from, but they've left that, and they've tried to make their own water containers, and they won't hold any water to start with. And so since they won't come to God, and their cisterns won't hold any water, or their, uh, their uh, system, which is their cisterns, now so what are they going to do? Look at verse 18. And now what hast thou to do in the way of Egypt to drink the waters of Shihor? Now that's one of the canals of the Nile River. That they bump, pump the water up into this for usage out of the Nile. Or what hast thou to do in the way of Assyria to drink the waters of the river? The river is the river Euphrates, which was the only major river in the air. When you see, when you see in the Bible the term the river, it can mean either the Nile River, which is the river to Egypt, and the word Nile means the river, by the way, in one language. Or if they're talking about towards the east of Israel, and they say the river, they're talking about the Euphrates. And both of those rivers have a spiritual meaning, a figurative meaning. The river of Nile 
stands for that life which is granted or afforded in this world, Egypt's life, or this world's life. Euphrates stands for false religion. Now, we could take you through enough scripture, so I'm sure you've come to this conclusion. And so, figuratively, what they had gone, they had been gone seeking the pleasures of this world in their uh, immorality, in drunkenness, and all of that. They had drunk of the waters of the Nile. And they had drunk of the waters of Euphrates. They had worshipped other gods besides the true God, which is the fountain of water. And this is the figure that's mean here, and meant here. And God is saying, you've left me the true source of life, and you've gone looking for life either the way this world has to offer it or else, else in false religions. In what better way could you describe it? I don't know. Uh, I, I see very little television, but one of my, the kids were talking about it today. I don't know where they see television, but uh, they were talking about it. And they said, in almost all the TV programs now, there's a big emphasis on the occult. And that uh, they even have these little computers and so forth, and they do something with a person's name and their uh, sign of the zodiac and all of that. Uh, and that it's just filled with the, uh, with the entertainment world, particularly. Well, that's uh, drinking of the waters of the Euphrates, being interested in, in these uh, off-base uh, religious practices, or uh, soaking ourselves in immorality like the lady I was speaking of. That's drinking of the Nile, figuratively in the Bible. And so what it, uh, God's making the comment in, verse, in chapter 7, verse 11 of Hosea, Ephraim also is a silly dove, Without heart, they call to Egypt and they go to Assyria. Now, they literally went to those countries for military help, but they also figuratively went to those countries in that they were looking for their life uh, somewhere other than in God. And he says that the fact that they are looking there will uh, cause him to bring a net upon them. It'd be like a, uh, the dove doesn't know where to go. So the only proper thing is to uh, is to have the poor uh, the, the dove's going to be devoured if the dove persists in going where the dove wants to go, and so the only hope for the dove is to snare the dove with a net and make the dove go where the dove doesn't want to go, or it'll die. And so that's what God is saying. Ephraim also is like a silly dove without heart. They call to Egypt and they go to Assyria. When they shall go, I will spread my net upon them. I will bring them down like fowls of heaven. I will chastise them as their congregation hath heard. Now, what does it mean, as their congregation has heard? Well, it's, uh, it's speaking of that which we were talking about last week. Remember, the blessings were cried out from Mount Gerizim and the curses from Mount Ebal. We read that in, uh, uh, well, we read it in Deuteronomy chapter 12. And we read it later in Deuteronomy. Didn't we do that here this last week? Yeah, I'm getting some nods. Well, that's what it means when it says, I will chastise them as their congregation has heard. In other words, God says, I'm going to do what I said I would do. So when they try to continually go to Egypt or go to Assyria, the silly dove doesn't know where to go. So I'm going to have to snare them and chastise them. Verse 13, Woe unto them, for they have fled from me, destruction unto them, because they have transgressed against me. Though I have redeemed them, yet they have spoken lies against me, and they have not cried unto me with their heart when they wailed upon their beds. They assembled themselves for corn and wine, and they rebel against me. In other words, they gather together never to call upon God. If they're gathering together, it's always for something to eat or drink. That's their purposes. In other words, they do a lot of partying, but none of it draws them to me. They've turned from me. Verse 15, Though I have bound and strengthened their arms, in other words, given them protection, 
Yet do they imagine mischief against me. They return, but not to the Most High. They are like a deceitful bow. Here's another figurative name for them. Um, the picture here is God is the hunter, and he hunts with arrows. And uh, Christ, I mean, uh, Isaiah uses this picture uh, of Christ being a, an arrow in God's quiver. And when Christ was here, he says, uh, I head uh, for Jerusalem like a flint. Let, let's look back in, in Isaiah and see this. Uh, Isaiah chapter 50 for a moment. Verse, you can tell this is talking about Christ. We'll, we'll start with verse 4. Isaiah 50 verse 4. The Lord God hath given me, Christ, the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to uh, him that who is weary, who wakeneth morning by morning, he waketh mine ear to hear, uh, uh, hear like the learner. The Lord God hath opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned backward. In other words, when Christ was here, he said, I do all the, always those things which please the Father. Now, in verse 6, you will see unmistakably this is a prophecy concerning Christ's earthly ministry. I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheeks to them who, that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Now, you can look these scriptures up in Matthew 27, 26, uh, in uh, John 18, 22, or any of the sections that tell about uh, Christ being misused. Uh, Matthew 26, 67, uh, Matthew 27, 30, Mark 14, 65, Mark 15, 19, and you'll see that all of these things happen literally to Christ. Of course, Isaiah wrote 700 years before Christ came. But now look what he says in verse 7 again. For the Lord God will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded. There, therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed or confounded. The flint is the arrowhead. And uh, if you want to see that in Christ's own words, when he was here, it's in Luke 9.51. He set his face to go to Jerusalem. He set his face like a flint. Uh, now look over in, in Isaiah 49, verse 2. He hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the hollow of his hand hath he hidden me and made me a polished shaft. That's an arrow. In his quiver hath he hidden me. And then it tells about the... Uh, the job God gave him to do. See verse 6, we're in Isaiah 49, 6. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the nations, uh, the Gentiles, the heathen, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. This is quoted in the New Testament applied to Christ. So the picture here is, he's calling Israel a deceitful arrow or a deceitful bow. Uh, the thought is this, that God has a job to do in this world. And God is the archer. And uh, he does his work with an arrow, bow and arrow. But when he wants to use it, the bow is so fouled up that it, the arrow doesn't hit its mark. It goes the wrong place. It's a deceitful bow. So what good is it? That's why Christ says that when he came, he would set his face like a flint. He would be hidden in the quiver, and uh, he would be a highly polished shaft. In other words, he would be true to the mark. He would do what God set out to do. He could say, I do always those things which please the Father. So this is a contrast here between Israel that was supposed to have been doing the work of God and carrying his message to all the world and Christ who came as the true bow and the true shaft and did the work that God gave him to do. He was a highly polished shaft. He set his face and he was true in the hands of the archer. But uh, they are like a deceitful bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword 
for the rage of their tongue, this shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. There is so much figurative language here. It's very colorful and very meaningful. And it's unlocked only as we compare this with other scriptures. In other words, the deceitful bow, calling Israel a deceitful bow means very little, or a silly dove, or a cake unturned, or that type of thing, unless you read the rest of the scriptures and look up the pertinent scriptures so that you know what that figure means. It means something. God doesn't call Israel a deceitful bow for nothing. And he doesn't call Israel a, a cake unturned for nothing, or an I, uh, or a, an adulterous wife for nothing. Uh, he's going to call uh, in the next chapter, watch in verse 9, for they are gone up to Assyria, a wild ass alone by himself. Uh, in verse 8, he's going to call Israel a vessel in which is no pleasure. In verse 9, he's going to call them a wild ass. Now, and as we say, these terms are used repeatedly. And the book of Hosea doesn't mean anything if we don't search out and find out what these terms mean. Why did God write in this manner? Well, some of our great poets and uh, writers that we regard so highly use this type of language. And the more they used and the more depth it had, the greater we esteemed them. Uh, I have a daughter who's a junior in college, and uh, she's uh, going to be an English teacher. So uh, she's learning a lot about literature, and she's become rather entranced with the style of Shakespeare. And she was reading one of Shakespeare's works today, and she made a comment on the, uh, uh, the mental energy that you really need if you're going to properly appreciate his wordage. That it's not just on the surface. Uh, if you're going to really know what the man's saying, and you're going to understand why he said what he said. It has substance, and of course, uh, that's why uh, we've given that particular individual such a high place in the literary world. Because he doesn't he speaks in such a way that you've got to think about it if you're going to come up with any real meaning. And a shallow thinker would say, Shakespeare's for the birds. Well, maybe some deep thinkers would say that. But, I mean, any shallow, a shallow thinker would say that, wouldn't he? Uh, I'm not saying, if, if that's your attitude about Shakespeare, I'm not saying you're a shallow thinker. I'm just saying that if you're a shallow thinker, that you necessarily say that. I might be in trouble. <laughs> uh, but anyway, what the point I want to make is this. We applaud human beings when they use uh, uh, the type of language that will cause us to have to stop and think or be mystified, one or the other. But yet, we question when God uses that uh, to a, a much deeper and more profound end. Uh, one place in the Bible, it says, the thoughts of God are very deep. And that word could be translated very profound. And he's sharing some of those profound thoughts with us. And his call, uh, thoughts, we could say, are very colorful and very worth delving into. And if some of the people that think Shakespeare is real cute uh, would, uh, would spend some of their mental energies uh, trying to find out what God means when he calls a people a silly dove or a, a cake not turned, if they would give some some thought and consideration to that, or a deceitful bow, uh, you'd find out that the eternal consequences would be, uh, would be great. Now, if anybody thinks I've been critical of the highest type of literature, 
secular literature, well, I plead innocent, and you just misunderstood me. Uh, but uh, all I'm saying is that you have something more profound and much deeper than any secular literature that's ever been written. And it's well worth your uh, thought, time, and attention. And this book of Hosea should prove that to you. And one of the reasons that you should be a student of the book of Hosea, because it has so much language that is very obviously figurative. There's no way in the world that you could come up with the opinion that there's no figurative language in Hosea. That would be an impossibility. So if it's figurative, of what is it a figure? That should intrigue us. That's why God writes that way. He wants us to be intrigued. He wants something to catch our interest and attention that we would think upon it. And he, he wants to write it in such a way there's no way you'd really know what he's saying except you'd spend the proper amount of time in meditation and in seeking from one place to the other in the Bible. And I just don't know of another book in the Bible that's better material for that type of exercise than this book. Shall we pray? Lord, we acknowledge tonight that you have used amazing methodology in, uh, in bringing your word to us. And we pray, God, that you would do that work in our own hearts, which is needful, that we might enjoy spending the necessary time to understand what you're saying when you use this type of profound language. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.